I want you to stand to your feet. I want you to take uh, your Bible and I want you to go to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, says these words. Wherefore seen we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and sin which do have so easily beset us. We talked about how heaven's grandstand is full with the matriarchs and patriarchs of old, how heaven's grandstand is, is full. You can read about those people in Hebrews chapter 11. And it says, let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Now we, we talked about how heaven's grandstand is full. And then we went to Hebrews chapter 11 and we started pulling people out of the Hall of Fame, Hall of Faith chapter. We pulled out Abraham and we pulled out Joseph and last week we pulled out Rahab the harlot. And we said, what if those people could run one lap with us? We're down here running the Christian race. But what if they could run one lap with us? What would we learn? Well, we want to pull another one out. Hebrews 11 and 7 says, By faith, Noah being warned of God, of things not seen as yet, he moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by which... He condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Let us pray. God, as we bow our heads and our hearts in your presence, I pray today that you would speak to us and through us. I pray today that you would give your word a free course to travel. I pray the invitation would be fruitful. And God, for all you do, we're gonna praise you, for I pray this prayer in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I wanna to talk to you about a lap with Noah, running a lap with Noah. I heard about a man who survived the Johnstown flood, and every time he got an opportunity, he would talk about how he survived the Johnstown flood, every opportunity. Well, finally he died. He went to heaven and Peter said, tonight we're having a banquet and you'll get to give a testimonial a little bit about your life. And the man said, well, I don't know if you know it, but I survived the Johnstown flood. And he said, I'd like to, like to talk about it. And Peter said, go right ahead. But I just want to warn you, Noah's going to be in the crowd. <laughs> well, I want to talk to you about Noah. And I want to talk to you about a lap with Noah. Years ago, there was a motivational speaker, kind of like a Zig Ziglar, but his name was Charles Tremendous Jones. And Charles Tremendous Jones made a statement that's probably the foundation for every message that I've preached in this series. This is what Charles Tremendous Jones said. He said, all the truth in the world would do you little good until God brings a man or woman across your path and you're able to see that truth in action. Then suddenly, that truth becomes a driving force in your life. I love that. All the truth in the world would do you little good 
until God brings a man or woman across your path and you're able to see that truth in action, then suddenly that truth becomes a driving force in your life. What I want us to do today, I want us to take Noah and I want us to get our pail under his well. And I want the truth in his life to become a driving force in our lives. Now there's a couple, four things I want you to see. The first thing I want you to see is this, the situation during the ark. The situation during the ark. From Adam to Noah was 2,000 years. So things had progressed 2,000 years from Adam to Noah. You say, well, preacher, how was it during Noah's day? Well, let's read. And God saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth. So wait, during Noah's day, wickedness was great and every imagination of the thought of people's hearts was only evil continually. That's how it was. Now, I do want to remind you something, folks. Matthew 24 and 37 says this, but is the days of Noah, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Man's heart was evil continually, but is the days of Noah, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. You say, well, pastor, it was so evil back then, and it's, it's like today. What was going on back then? Well, let's read. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them. Well, what happened? Men and women started having children. Well, look what happens after that. And the sons of God are, wait, the angels of God. Now, I'm not a male chauvinist. Anybody that knows me knows I'm not. But every angel mentioned in the Bible was a male angel. You say, well, preacher, were they female angels? They could have been. I'm not saying there wasn't. But I'm just trying to get you to see every angel mentioned in the Bible by name was a male angel. Will there be females? I'm sure there will. Look. <laughs> Those angels, female angels will be up, up in the air harping about something. Amen. There, let's move on. <clears throat> now wait. And those male angels saw the daughters of men were fair and they took them as wives. Well, look. When these angels came down and they had relations with the daughters of men, Angels having relations with girls. What about God? It upset God. God said, my spirit shall not always strive with man. For he also that is flesh, yet, yet shall be 120 years. Now wait. And then the Bible says they were giants in the earth. Why were they giants in the earth? Why were they giants, Pastor Benny, in the earth? Because the angels of God had relations with the daughters of men, which was abnormal, and it created abnormal beings. Now, I know what you're sitting there thinking. You're thinking, Pastor, what perversion? Well, wait. Wait. In America, every year, there's 200,000 incidents of sex trafficking. The entry age is 12 years old. Wait, the second largest city in the world for sex trafficking is Atlanta, Georgia. You say, wait, Pastor Benny, what perversion? What, what, what perversion? Folks, in 2002, our country we passed the Marriage Equality Act. What does that say? That says in every state, 
in every state, two men or two women can get married. In every state, and it's legal. Right now, we have the Equality Act in Congress. What, what, Pastor, what is the Equality Act? Well, it basically says that men can go in women's restrooms. It says that children can choose their gender without parental consent. That means a child can literally choose to have a surgery to change their gender without parental consent. You say, preacher, I don't, I don't see this happening more. 10 years ago, there were two hospitals in America that did sex changes. Today, there are 50 hospitals in America that does sex changes. Now, wait. You say, Pastor Benny, do you have family members that are in alternative lifestyles? Yes, on both sides of my family. Very close people on both sides of my family. Well, what do you think, Pastor Benny? Well, all this perversion that was going on in Noah's day. Well, Genesis 7 and 1 says this, folks. God said, I've seen righteous, righteousness before me in Noah. He said, I see righteousness before me in Noah. What did Noah do? Well, what the Bible says in 2 Peter. And spare not the old world, but save Noah, the eighth person. Wait, he was a preacher of righteousness. So what does the church attitude have to be? Look, the church attitude has to be what is right in the eyes of God. What is right in the eyes of God? Listen, it's not my opinion. It's not your opinion, folks. It's what does God's word say? Now, here's what God's word says. In Genesis 2, 24, it says, Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. This is not what I said. This is what God said. God said marriage is between a man and a woman. <laughs> Wait. Genesis 1 and 27 says this. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created him. Wait, male and female, he created them. Amen. Male and female, he created them. You're not gonna convince me that God makes mistakes. I don't think God ever created somebody and said, oops. <laughs> no, male and female, he created them. Well, Leviticus 20 and 13 says it's an abomination for a man to lie with a man. It's an abomination for a woman to lie with a woman. Now, look, what, what, what do you think we got to do, Pastor Benny? Here's what we got to do. We got to say what we mean. We got to mean what we say, but we don't have to say it mean. And we got to Say, let God be true and every man a liar. By the way, I, in a month, I'll be 59 years old. And I know what you're thinking. He looks much younger. Look here. In, in a month, I'll be 59 years old. But the older I get, the more concerned I am about what God's going to say to me than what people are saying about me. We got to take what God's word says, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Diedrich Bonhoeffer said these words. He said, silence in the face of evil is evil itself. Amen. See, I see, uh, I see the situation in the ark, but look, <clears throat> I see the sarcasm in the ark. The sarcasm in the ark. Can you imagine this guy? He's building this boat 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, 45 feet high, but wait, it's never rained. He's telling them the flood's coming. It's never sprinkled. You say, preacher, how do you know that? Well, the Bible tells us in Genesis 2, 6 that God watered the ground from underneath. God watered the ground from underneath. Now, now let me make some quick statements about this. Statement number one, when God tells you to do something, it may not make sense. 
When God tells you to do something, it may not make sense. Because see, the Bible tells us that in Genesis 7, 5, it says, and Noah did according to all the Lord commanded him. When God tells you to do something, folks, it may not make sense. But if it's God, obey him. Now let me make statement number two. <laughs> Don't be afraid to stand out in a crowd. <laughs> Get this, young people. You weren't called to fit in. You were called to stand out. Young people, listen, if you always follow a crowd, you'll never be followed by a crowd. And you know why a leader stands out in a crowd? It's because a leader has learned how to be alone with God without the crowd. Here's what I would say to you. <laughs> Don't be afraid to stand out in the crowd. No, no, the third thing I'd say is... Uh, don't be afraid to do something for the very first time. You say, well, I can't do that. Well, who says you can't? <coughs> Pastor Benny, I'm 46. If I go back to school now, when I graduate, I'll be 50 years old. <laughs> well, if you don't go back to school four years from now, you'll still be 50 years old. I mean, don't be afraid to step out and do something for the very first time. You said, Brother Benny, when you've stepped out and done things, you always were courageous. No, no, no. Many times I stepped out and I was scared to death. But you know what I've realized, folks? <laughs> it was amateurs that built the ark. It was professionals that built the Titanic. So all I'm saying to you, don't, don't be afraid to step out for the very first time. Let me, let me tell you the fourth thing I'd throw at you right quick. Don't let age hold you back. Don't let age hold, hold you back. I mean, I know God was multiplying the earth, but get real. Noah was 480 years old. Moses was 80 years old before he started leading the children of Israel out of Egypt. When Caleb was 85, he said, give me that mountain. I heard about a man, 91 years old, married a 26 year old. Now I'm not saying I recommend that, but <laughs> 91 years old, he marries a 26 year old and his 72 year old daddy is irate. I mean, his 72 year old son is irate. Dad. You're 91, she's 26. This is ridiculous, dad. He said, dad, get real. This could be fatal. <laughs> he said, son, if she dies, she dies, amen. <laughs> Did you know the New England Journal of Medicine said, the most productive years of a person's life. Your occupational life, the most productive decade of your life is from 60 to 70. I'm just getting started. <laughs> I mean, the most productive years are from 60 to 70. But the second most productive decade is from 70 to 80. You don't need to retire, you need to refire. <laughs> no, and the third most productive years are from 50 to 60. Let me tell you the third thing. That's the safety of the ark. Now, get this, folks. Noah was in this ark 370 days. And according to 1 Peter 3, verses 20 and 21, the ark symbolized Jesus Christ. Here's what I want you to know something. God didn't tell them to go in the ark. He told them to come in the ark. Read Genesis 7, 1. And the Lord said unto Noah, come thou and thy house into the ark. Folks, he didn't tell them to go in. He told them to come in. Because he was already in there. 
Let me tell you something. They may have gone through some stormy times, but he was in the ark with them. And ladies and gentlemen, if you've got Jesus, he'll never leave you nor forsake you. He didn't tell them to come in, go in. He said, come in. Look, look. there's a second thing I want you to see. All that went in the ark came out of the ark. Look what the Bible says in Genesis 8, 18. And Noah went forth and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him. You know what I believe? I believe there were some storms and I believe they probably fell in the ark. I believe they probably fell around in that ark. But I've got good news. They didn't fall out of the ark. They didn't fall out of the ark. And I'll tell you something, I'd rather be in a storm with Jesus than a calm without him. Because I've lived long enough to learn safety's not the absence of storms, safety's the presence of the Savior, that he's with us no matter what. Let me tell you though, I'm just researching folks. I'll tell you something else I learned about the ark. The ark didn't have a steering wheel and it only had one window. Now process this, no ham, no prowl, no steering wheel. Why? Because God was staring that jammy. See the problem folks is we're wanting a steering wheel. Amen. Uh, we, no, we're, we're wanting to guide everything. We're wanting to control. You're a control freak. You're even driving your wife crazy. <laughs> because you've got to control everything. I don't know who that was for, but it felt good. Amen. I mean, you're just a control freak. You, you've got to control everything. But God said, no, no, this, thing, this thing's not going to have a steering wheel. Now, now listen to this. Wait, wait, folks. 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, 45 feet high. Look, but Wait. One window in it. Preacher, you got to be kidding. One window? Exactly right. Read your Bible. Genesis 6, 16. It's in the roof. Because wait, if you look ahead, you get dismayed. If you look back, you get discouraged. If you look around you, you get disappointed. But if you look up, you get delivered, amen? <laughs> now wait, I, I, I'm almost done. If you get finished before I do, just slip out. <laughs> but I want you to see this. This is so good. This is where God spoke to my heart. I want you to see the solidification of the ark. The solidification of the ark. Genesis 8, verses 3 and 4 says this. And the waters returned from off the earth continually. After the end of 150 days, the waters were abated. Now wait. The ark rested on the seventh month, on the 17th day of the month, upon the mountains of Ararat. Now, now, now get this, folks. After 150 days the water started to abate. The water started to go down. And the ark rested on Mount Ararat, which is a, 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 a beautiful mountain there in Turkey. It, it just, it, it rested there. And the Bible says the, 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 the waters started to go down. But go back to the verse, look what it says. The ark rested in the seventh month on the 17th day of the month. Now look, the Jewish calendar starts in October. And look, don't miss next Sunday. What's happening in Israel is prophesied in the Bible. And I'm gonna tell you where it's prophesied, I'm going to tell you what the future is from God's Word. But you hear me closely. Zechariah chapter 2 verses 8 says, when you touch Israel, 
you touch the pupil of God's eye. And Psalms 121 verse four says, he that watcheth over Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. And let me tell you something, there's gonna be a great payday for Hamas. There's gonna be a great payday for Hamas. And I want you to know something. The Bible says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem because God's going to prosper those that love Israel. God's going to prosper those that love Israel. And if God really blesses America like God wants to bless America, America can't keep giving money to Iran that's providing funding, that's providing funding, that's providing funding for, for Islamic terrorists. I, I, I got to get back to my message. But look, go back to that verse. But it rested on the seventh month. Now wait, the first month was October. The seventh month was April. Look, and it rested on the 17th day, three days after Passover. <laughs> when did it resurrect, Pastor? I mean, when did it rest, Pastor? On the very same day that Jesus resurrected, triumphant over death, hell, and the grave. Look, look, at, look at Genesis 5, 21. Look what it says. It says, and Enoch lived 65 years and begat Methuselah. You, you've heard people say, my goodness, he's old as Methuselah. He's old as Methuselah. Well, the Bible tells us in Genesis 5 and 27 that Methuselah lived 969 years and he died. What does the word Methuselah mean, Pastor? It means when he dies, judgment comes. When he dies, judgment comes. Genesis 5:25. Methuselah lived 180 and seven years and he began Lamech. Verse 28, and Lamech lived 180 and two years and began a son, wait, and called him Noah. 187, 182, 369, Genesis 7 and 11. And the 600 year of Noah's life in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day where all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were open, 369, 600, 969, Methuselah breathed his last breath and God sent the flood, God sent judgment. Say, so preacher, what do you mean? Here's what I mean. Genesis 9, 16 said, God said, I'm not going to destroy this place again with water. And every time you see a rainbow, let it be a reminder to you that our God keeps his promises. Every time you see a rainbow, let it be a reminder that our God keeps his promises. See folks, I'm done. But Noah did a great job building this boat. But there's one thing he didn't do. According to Genesis chapter seven, verse 16, God shut the door to that ark. God shut the door to that ark. And then the Bible says this in Revelation 3, 7, when God shuts the door, no man can open. So what's your advice, Pastor, to me today? You need to make sure you're inside the ark when God shuts the door. You need to make sure you're inside the ark when God shuts the door because Genesis 6 and 3 said, my spirit shall not always strive with man. I got up yesterday day morning and I said to Barbara, I said, Barbara, prophecies being fulfilled right before our eyes. People are running to and fro. They don't have their minds on God. They don't have their minds on getting right with God. They have their mind on their next excursion, the next party, the next thing they're going to do. But ladies and gentlemen, we better 
better get right with God. We better serve God. It's the 11 o'clock hour and Jesus is coming soon.